if someone came to you and they said, I'm struggling with my sleep, I've, you know, multiple nights in a row, I haven't been able to sleep, I'm getting in bed and nothing's happening. And then I'm waking up and I'm just sat there thinking about, you know, sleeping and um, I feel horrific. Where would you start? So I would start, I think, by trying to understand what it is that is causing their sleep issues. Because a lot of the individuals that I see who have been referred in with that sort of picture assume that they've got insomnia. And they may not always have insomnia. So I, I think a key issue is that we are really, really poor witnesses to our own sleep. And what I mean by that is that we often our experience of sleep is very different to the reality of sleep. When we bring in people into the sleep laboratory, it's not at all unusual. And I will almost always ask this question when I'm going through a sleep study with one of my patients, is how much sleep do you think you got over the course of that night? And it's not at all unusual for people to say to me, well, I think I got two or three hours sleep. Occasionally, even they say, well, I didn't sleep at all. And then you look at their brain waves, you look at the best objective marker that you've got of their sleep, and you see that they've slept seven and a half, eight hours. So obviously, what people are experiencing is really important, because ultimately, from my perspective, I want to improve people's experience of their sleep and what it is that they're, they're, they're complaining of. But it's important to understand that what they're telling you may not necessarily be the objective truth. Now, that's really important when it comes to insomnia, because it's not unusual for me to see individuals who, you know, they give you a story of very clear insomnia, but actually when you look at their sleep objectively, you find that although they say they haven't slept at all, they've slept seven hours, but that seven hours has been completely disrupted by conditions like periodic limb movement disorder, which is this, these leg kicks associated with restless leg syndrome, or sleep apnea, for example. Now, sometimes it's very evident from what people tell you that actually that's not the case, that they've just got very clear insomnia. So, so that's really the starting point to try and decide whether or not you feel confident enough in your clinical evaluation of them that, that you know what the issue is without doing a sleep study. And if you think that they do need a sleep study, then that's the point at which we, we, are, we arrange for that. It's also trying to understand some of the factors that might be driving their sleep difficulty. So, for example, was their sleep, were their sleep difficulties triggered by a life event? Did they have sleep reactivity before this insomnia started? So were they one of those individuals who could sleep anywhere at any time, whatever they wanted, uh, whenever they wanted to put their head down? Or were they kind of an individual who the night before an exam, before a job interview, before a, a presentation would lose sleep? Because that often is a very strong marker for developing insomnia uh, later on in life. Uh, and then it's also about trying to understand how the rest of their health is impacted by their sleep, but also how the rest of their health impacts on sleep. So it's not at all unusual for me to see individuals who have been started on medications for other reasons that have generated sleep issues, for example. You talked about this sort of obsession with sleep. Mm. Um, and I was wondering, in the case of the patient you've just described, would you encourage them to wear a sleep tracker? So uh, f first of all, I have to say that I'm not ideologically opposed to sleep trackers in general. I think that they are really, really good, for example, in research. Um, you know, fantastic for research. It allows us to track sleep in very, very large numbers of individuals and try and work out how that correlates with whatever we're interested in. One of the major issues with sleep trackers is that the people who often use sleep trackers are individuals who already are concerned about their sleep. So if you know that you're sleeping relatively little and you wake up feeling tired, then you probably know you're not sleeping enough. You don't necessarily need a sleep tracker to tell you that. If you're one of these individuals who has insomnia, who is spending plenty of time in bed but simply cannot get the amount of sleep that they need, um, then what a sleep tracker will do is it will increase your concern your anxiety around your sleep. It's a very different picture for, from, for example, using a, a step tracker. If you're sitting on the sofa and you look at your step tracker and you realize you've only done whatever it is, 5,000 steps, it's very easy to get up and go for a walk and do another 5,000 steps. If your sleep tracker is telling you you slept really badly and you know you slept really badly and you're already worried about how badly you sleep, 
There's nothing that you can do on the basis of the information that your sleep tracker is giving you to suddenly go and get a little bit more sleep. And it's complicated by the fact that, you know, sleep trackers are pretty good at telling you how much time you spent in bed. They're reasonably good at telling you how quickly you dropped off to sleep. The reliability, the accuracy of these devices, most of these devices, drops off significantly when it comes to, for example, defining nighttime awakenings, defining stages of sleep, those kinds of things. So then you have that additional issue in the mix, which is that sometimes your sleep tracker may be giving you information that is not factually correct, and that may increase your anxiety further. So I'm really very, very keen for people who have issues with their sleep rather than just burning the candle at both ends, to put away their sleep tracker and actually go and have a chat with their GP or somebody who knows a little bit about sleep rather than relying on this sleep tracking technology. Do you think sleep trackers have had a net negative or positive impact on sleep culture? I think that for those individuals who can fix their sleep in a very straightforward way by spending more time in bed, so the kind of people that I talked about that 20 years ago would be saying, well, you know, I only sleep five hours and, you know, because I'm busy doing X, Y and Z and I can get away with it. I think it's probably encouraged them to spend a bit more time in bed because they know they have a, a very clear, um, very clear bit of information that's telling them that they're not sleeping enough. But for the people that I see, the people who are already concerned about their sleep, uh, and who have difficulties with their sleep, I think it's been a very negative impact. Um, and I have some reservations about, well, people like myself um, sitting on these kinds of podcasts or writing in newspapers telling you, well, you know, if you don't get enough sleep, you're going to die early, you're going to have all these negative health consequences. Because for a subgroup of individuals who are already very concerned about their sleep, that actually can Make it cause... Worse problems. And I have seen individuals who, for example, have read books on sleep and how important it is on sleep, who have ended up going into a spiral of insomnia and very catastrophic depression and anxiety as a result. So so it's very, you know, it's very important to be clear that the, all of this is a double-edged sword. It's interesting with, with sleep trackers. Um, I can see, I think it's worth me saying, that I am both an investor in Whoop and I'm also sponsored by Whoop. Okay. But I also agree with the things you've said. So I've seen this this sort of variance in how a sleep tracker can improve some people's lives and it can make other people more anxious in a way that's not helpful. So for me, my sort of testimony on it is um, I was one of those people you described earlier that thought sleep was take it or leave it. And when I started seeing a sleep track, it's kind of like that when I saw my brain for the first time, I did a brain scan and I didn't even kind of like realize it was there and that I could influence it and that things I was doing mm -hmm. um, without really thinking much were having this big impact. And for me, what it did is it allowed me to finally make this link between how much sleep I've had and then how I behave. Now, I thought my behavior was random before, mm. but seeing that when, when my sleep um, scores were down, I was way more emotional. I was way more likely to eat crap. Uh, and the other thing that I saw, which was really interesting, was that when I had a glass of wine or two glasses of wine or three glasses of wine, that it just like a, destroyed my sleep. And I never knew that before. And I was in search of reasons to quit alcohol anyway. And when I saw that, I quit alcohol forever. So I've not drunk since. So, and then for me, I have to also say, there are moments in my life where life happens and I know I'm not gonna sleep and I don't pay attention to my sleep tracker. But there are other moments where I have a bit more control and that's when I kind of tune into my sleep tracker. I've also had parents message me a lot and say, listen, I've got a one-year-old, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, two three whatever. There's no point in me wearing a sleep tracker because listen, I'm not going to get any sleep. And I also completely agree with them that there's really no point in that situation. I think there's a point when there's something you can do about it. Yeah, and that's, kind of what that, that's, that's absolutely key. Yeah. So so the, 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 the point of doing anything like that is if there are very clear things that you can do on your own, 
to close that loop. There's no point having information without being able to act upon it. Yeah. And I guess if you are one of those individuals like yourself who very clearly can correlate certain things that they're doing in their daytime lives with their sleep and 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 how they feel subsequently, then then great. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess I have a little bit of bias in that the people that I see are already struggling with their sleep already. Yeah. And so it goes back, I, I guess we're completely in agreement. Yeah, yeah we are, yeah. And it's so interesting because I that's been a developing idea because obviously my bias is always like, wouldn't you rather know? Because mm. that's, you know, but then ha- from doing this podcast, I've I've seen the comments and I've seen the struggle in from speaking to parents that struggling with their sleep and it's kind of sometimes just makes them feel worse about it. Um, I think nuance is necessary on this issue. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot, of, a lot of things in my life that I wouldn't like to tr- be able to track because either I, f- I don't have control of them right now or you know, um, maybe they'd make me feel more anxious. There's this thing called the glymphatic system, which I yeah. find really, which when I discovered this, I, I, it really helped me to understand the importance of sleep. Can you explain what the glymphatic system is as if I was a 10 year old? Yeah. So, um, within our bodies, there is a, a system, a very similar system called the lymphatic system. So people will have heard of lymph nodes, for example. And this is a system whereby fluid that comes out of the blood vessels and into the tissues is then collected and transported back into the the cardiovascular system. And we used to think that n- there was no equi- equivalent system in the brain. But actually, you know, over the last 20 years, we've understood that whilst there are no sort of lymph nodes or things like that, there are these very small channels between the cells that are responsible for draining fluid from the brain. And um, those um, systems are responsible for removing certain toxins or metabolites, chemicals that are built up as a result of metabolic activity within the brain and removing them from the brain substance itself. Now, It's like a car wash. Um, like, like a drainage system, you know, like, like, like a gutter, for example, um, you know, that takes the suds from the car wash away and puts them into the drain. Um, in about 2011, if my memory serves me correct, there were some studies done that looked at that glymphatic system in different stages of sleep. And what they described was that that glymphatic system opens up significantly by about 60% in very deep sleep in the deepest stages of sleep and so and so subsequent research showed that for example one of the proteins that was being removed was a protein called beta amyloid that is that is intimately tied to alzheimer's disease and so the view that deep sleep was particularly resp- uh, responsible for housekeeping of the brain, for chemical housekeeping of the brain, came about. And it gets a bit more complicated because actually only a two or three weeks ago, another study suggested that that 60% increase in the glymphatic system was not the case. And so I think that this remains an area that there is some uncertainty about. But actually, there are many reasons to tie in sleep in general separate from the glymphatic system into a general housekeeping role of the brain and i think that um certainly this is an area that is going to keep researchers very very busy over the next 10 or 20 years this uh, association between sleep cognition and cognitive decline in later life that that protein that seems to sp- spike if we are sleep deprived Mm -hmm. but beta amyloid beta amyloid yeah and that's linked to alzheimer's it is yeah so in alzheimer's disease we see beta amyloid deposition within the brain substance itself what does deposition mean so uh it's deposited within the brain if someone has alzheimer's they have a a sort of the build build, a build up of a build up of beta amyloid in the the brain substance is there a link between sleep deprivation and alzheimer's Do we see high numbers? So there is some evidence to suggest that uh, both chronic sleep deprivation and insomnia are associated with cognitive decline and conditions like dementia. It goes back to what I was saying earlier, which is, but by the way, there's also some studies that have suggested links between sleeping tablets and conditions like Alzheimer's. So it goes back to this issue of whether or not it's Uh, the insomnia or the sleep deprivation that causes Alzheimer's, 
is it sleeping tablets that causes Alzheimer's or is it the fact that Alzheimer's many, many years before causes changes to our sleep? Uh, and so I think that that story has not yet been um, has not yet come to fruition in terms of our fundamental understanding of the links between sleep and Alzheimer's disease and whether or not it's directly causative. Do you recommend slash are you a fan of, you reference sleep tablets there, sleep medicine, medication? Yeah. So as a general rule, no, because I think that there are um, good now non-drug-based techniques for trying to improve sleep in the majority of people with insomnia. Um, there is some evidence that, for example, if people don't respond to these non-drug-based methods, giving them sleeping tablets alongside these non-drug-based methods makes it more likely for the psychological route to help. But you know, unfortunately, as part of my clinical practice, I see lots of people who've been struggling with their sleep for many, many years, and they've tried all non-drug-based treatments. And the risks of them sleeping so little in terms of their mood, their anxiety, their ability to function are, are, are so great that actually you have on a case-by-case -case basis to make a judgment call as to whether or not to say, well, I give up on your sleep, or actually you say, well, look, there are a number of drugs that we can try to try and improve your sleep. And it's not going to get you back to normal, but it's going to potentially make the difference between you, you know, end up very depressed or, or, or highly anxious and unable to cope in your life or actually get some decent sleep. Um, and the risks of those drugs, and that needs to be judged on a case-by-case -case basis and is part of clinical medicine. Whenever we prescribe any medication for anybody for any condition, we have to evaluate what the potential benefits are versus the potential risks. If you love the Diver CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.